Think about when I first started getting recognized as a good kickboxer. When, I, when you see your name in the magazine, like you're in the top ten of the world, and you kind of think, man, I don't know, the top world's a big place. Do I really, do I really belong here? Hello, everyone. It's time for another episode of Martial Arts Radio, the show that brings you amazing stories from the world's best martial artists. Today, we're talking to Mr. Dale Fry, and this is episode 126. At Whistlekick, we mix the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the web's best podcast on the traditional martial arts, twice a week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the host and founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out for the first time. Today, we're featuring our sweatpants, available in both black and gray. They're pretty much the perfect pants. They're incredibly comfortable. They've got side pockets, an open ankle, you know, none of that annoying cuff at the bottom of your pants, and with both elastic and a drawstring. Check them out in both, like I said, black and gray, and maybe you want to get two pairs because you might have trouble wearing anything else. At least that's the feedback we get from some of our customers. If you want to see the show notes, including some incredible celebrity photos and links to everything we talk about today with Mr. Fry, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you're not on the newsletter list, what are you waiting for? We send out exclusive content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we're going to send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, an exclusive podcast episode. Sign up for the newsletter at any of our websites. Mr. Dale Fry has done a lot, to be blunt, from winning world titles in kickboxing to an acting resume that's been impressive for literally decades. Whether it's kicks or stunts or acting, Mr. Fry, who is also known by his fighting name, Sunshine, has certainly left his mark. We had a great chat, and I think you'll enjoy it. Let's welcome him to the show. Mr. Fry, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here and looking forward to learning all about you and your journey through the arts and kickboxing and traveling the world and and those title belts that I know we're going to get into in just a little bit. But we always start in a pretty straightforward way because it gives gives me, gives the audience context for who we're going to talk to. How did you get started in martial arts? I started in martial arts. You know, it's funny as my brothers had some boxing gloves and, um, all the neighborhood kids would box and what, and then I guess they kind of grew out of them, and I required them, and me and my buddies boxed in the neighborhood, and that was the beginning of any. I wouldn't, I guess, I wouldn't call that martial arts, but uh, fighting per se. And uh, but I wrestled in high school. I took martial arts early, and then I wrestled in high school and got out of martial arts a little bit, and picked it back up. And then I got into boxing, and then after that, I got into kickboxing. So that was a, the process that kind of took me into it. Okay. So that's it, it's a kind of a broad start, right? Yeah, very broad. You know, what we might call traditional martial arts and boxing and wrestling, and then finally to kickboxing. So there must have been something in those earlier trainings and classes that you enjoyed, but it wasn't quite what you were looking for. You know, at that time, I really liked the fighting part of it. I really, I just liked the fighting part. Like I, I didn't, I wasn't into the forms and doing nunchucks and size and whatnot. I just liked the fighting part of it. And that it is what it is, what it is, but that's, that's what I liked. What was it about that? that really resonated for you? You know, I wish I could put my finger on that, Jeremy. Um, one time me and my buddy was sparring. We were boxing at his house one day. He's got a little gym set up at his house, and we sparred five or six rounds, beating on each other. And um, after the fact, I hugged him, he hugged me, and I said, man, that was fun. And it has never hit me before until that day. I said, man, we just sit here. This is my buddy Randy Ballard, who was the trainer as well. It never hit me until that day. I said, wait a minute. We just sat here and beat on each other for six rounds, and it was fun. And it's like, man, maybe 
we need to be looked at or something. Maybe we need to be checked out because that doesn't it, it, just, it doesn't seem right, but it, it is what it is. And I wish somebody could shine some light on me. What is what is it about that physical contact and get getting hit on that is fun? That is, uh, I don't think it's for everybody, but a uh, certain faction of us that really like it. Yeah. Can you shine some con- light on me there? Well, um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Did other contact sports ever appeal to you? Football or lacrosse or rugby or something like that? You know, I raced motocross back in the day, and that was not really a motor. That was not really a contact sport. It's it's physical, but uh, I guess I was too small to play football. I did play football a couple of years in junior high, and uh, like I say, maybe the wrestling. But um, I did really well in super in motocross. But no, it's an no intense sport. Th- and you're, I, you're... I, I, I love basketball. I play basketball. I love playing basketball. But that, like I said, I wasn't really. Sometimes you go contact, but it's. I guess just the athletic stuff of it. I guess. But mm-hmm. the actual getting hit on, I can't understand why we enjoyed that like we did. Well, maybe as we talk, we'll come up with some theories. We can, there you go. We can talk about it some more. I mean, who, hey, it's, you know, no. some viewers can pitch in on that and help us out. Yeah, that's right. Some listeners. So, I say. right. Right. I mean, we'll we'll put some pictures up, but no, f- fortunately, this is not a video show. I am certainly not dressed to, <laughs> for anything of that nature. I'm standing here in athletic shorts and a T-shirt. Not really the way I'd put myself out there if this was a video show. <laughs> well, as long as now, of know. course, you had some time traveling and, and kickboxing and some titles and, and things like that. And, you know, everybody's got their stories and I'm sure you've got a ton of them. Tell us your best one. Like if somebody pinned you down and said, you know, you've got to well, one that entertain out, us with your, your greatest moment, what would that be? One that sticks out was probably, you know, it's funny how once you retire, which I've been retired probably 12 years or something like that. Once you retire, you think about it, it's crazy. The ones you think about are the ones that you lost. You know, even though, uh, even... You know, I was out in South Dakota one time, and I saw this sign. I think it was Sitting Bull, and he had – this reporter, this um, American reporter had been following this big Indian seance thing they have every year, lasts like a week, and he had been reporting on this thing, and he asked Sitting Bull. I think it was Sitting Bull or Crazy Horse, one of those two Indian chiefs, and I read this on a sign out there. And he said, look, I've been here for a week, and I have not heard anybody say anything about the Battle of Little Bighorn which is the greatest American, I mean, the greatest Indian victory of all time, you know, when they beat down Custer, you know, Custer's last stand and all that. Right, right. And Sidney Bull said, he said, yes, he said, victory is sweet, but it is fleeting. But defeat lingers longer and cuts deeper. And I said, wow, that, and that's the way it is in kickboxing. Now, I have obviously won more fights than I've lost, but those ones that you lose really stick out. And um, I fought a kid with my first, I, I had a chance at my first world title in Memphis, Tennessee. I was fighting a kid by the name of Ch- uh, Norris Williams, and he had been knocking out everybody in the second, third round. So I went out there kind of being a little bit cautious. I said, man, I don't want to go home until everybody got knocked out in the second or third round. So I was a little bit cautious those first couple of rounds. And then after about three rounds, I said, man, this guy didn't hit any harder than anybody else I've been in with. So we went at it for 12 rounds, and he beat me in a 12-round fight. He beat me by one point for a world right. title. And it wow. was crushing, man. I mean, I literally cried in the draft. And I still get a little choked up today when I think about it. But um, he was a great fighter, and he won that fight. And for whatever, maybe I shouldn't have been cautious to begin with, whatever it wasn't meant to be. But it taught me a lot. And you had to pick up, and he moved up. I, I think he moved up in weight. And about a year later, I got another shot at a world title and was able to win it then. So, um, And I won some other titles in some lesser divisions as well. But um, those defeats, Jeremy, really really stick with you. And, you know, I could say I probably lost only two fights that only I really got beat at. Um I had to lose weight a lot of times and cutting weight sometimes I would I would 
catch a little cold or get a little sick or something. So I would, I fought plenty of times. I won some fights when I wasn't a hundred percent, but a lot of times I would lose fights because of that. And when I lost my title, I was, uh, I was as sick as I could be, but they went 12 rounds and lost 12 round decision. But that's, you know, that's what you do. You know what I mean? It was, even though losing weight was hard, I couldn't just advocate the title and say, look, I'm going to just give this up because I worked hard to get it. And later in my career, I started lifting weights and bulked up just a little bit. I mean, got a little muscle on it, but that made it even harder to lose that weight. So, but one story that sticks out is that when I lost my first world title is when I lost. And, uh, and I didn't, I didn't go crazy. I didn't quit, stomp. You know, I did cry a little bit and picked up the pieces and moved on and had a nice career after that. And, uh, when I did, I, I held my title for six years straight. So that was a, a big accomplishment. So getting the title is one thing, but holding on to it is quite another. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure when you're the champion. I would yeah. expect people expecting yeah. you to win. And some people respond well to that kind of pressure. Some people, uh, and I, I'm in this category, do better being the underdog. Mm-hmm. So when you when you lost that fight, what what was it like to recover psychologically from that? I mean, physically, I think everyone can understand what that's like. You know, you're banged up. I mean, we know how to heal physically, but something that meant so much to you and to be so close. Well, like what, I say, was, that, what was that uh, like to? It, it is a blow, man. That is sure because I had been working very hard, and this is your dream. When you start, it comes a point when you start thinking, man, I'm. I want to be a world champion. I want to be a world champion kickboxer, and that's your dream. And I obviously had the kicking background and the boxing background, and I would have never been a world champion had did I not have that boxing background. I'll, I'll say that to anybody. But the boxing part really helped me. Even though I had good kicks, the boxing really saved me. It really helped me out a lot. But uh, it, you know, it's, it's like losing a girlfriend. Um, you have to, you have to just put in some time, man. You have to put in some time because this is a dream, and you've been working this hard to, and and to get that close to it, and then it's like having the rug pulled out from under you. But like I say, and I, I'll go to talk to kids and stuff at schools and whatnot, and I'll and I'll tell them this story. I'll say, hey, in life, you don't get everything you want. You don't get the girlfriend you don't. You don't. You don't get the girlfriend that you want. You may not get the job you want or the tennis shoes you want, and that. And I will say, you know, you don't, you don't just quit. You don't start drinking, going crazy, doing drugs, and just try to wash it out. You just suck it up, and and, and time, like I say, time heals everything. But um, but that, but that, it, it was a tough time, man. and even when I went back, when I went back, you know, I always take a little time off after a fight, and when I went back to it having that same spark, it, it took a little bit and, and, but it's, it's like, say, you just have to put in, put in some time. You have to grieve a little bit. And, uh, and I did that and just take some walks and stuff like that. But, um, you have to move on. And that's, yeah. fortunately I, I learned from it and, you know, being your first world title is the first time you're going 12 rounds. So that's in the back of your head. 12 rounds is a long time when you've never done it, you know, so it's it's always kind of in the back of your head to begin with anyway. And um, so there was a lot going on. And mentally, you, you know, I think about when I first started getting recognized as a good kickboxer, when I, my my name came out in like the top 10 ratings, ratings for the world. And when you see your name in the magazine, like you're the, in the top 10 of the world and you you kind of think, man, I don't know. The top world's a big place. Do I really, do I really belong here? Am, am I that good? And so you kind of question yourself sometimes. And then as you grow, and, and and I'll compare it to like going to school. You go to first grade, second grade, third, and you go all the way up. And there's learning steps along the way. Is how you how you develop. You know, you're young, so you, you you know there's something to be said with maturity and age. You just learn stuff and pick up on stuff and. Like when I wrestled, man, sometimes I either won or lost before I ever got on the mat because mentally I knew who this guy was, and I said, man, I'm going to do this, and the other, I'm probably going to lose this fight. I might lose, you know. So I didn't have the the attitude that I got later on in kickboxing where I, 
I was not able to get mean and stuff like that. And I'm a pretty easygoing person. But once once you kind of learn to get mean, and when I first won my first big karate uh, kickboxing title was out in Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, and this guy I was fighting had a jacket on that says uh, Colorado Golden Gloves or something about Golden Gloves. And there was a time when I, because I really respected boxing, and there was a time when I'd seen something like that that would have uh, just kind of given me a, given that guy a mental edge. I might have said, oh, man, he's a boxer. He obviously, Golden that might have psyched me out a little bit. But that was the day that I said, man, I don't care if he has a jacket on that says I just beat King Kong. I'm going to beat that boy's ass today. That's, it's just the way it is. I'm going to be. I don't care what he's done, who he beat. He's got it coming today. And And that particular day, that night, day, whatever, that was when it really hit for me. And, and and my whole personality, you know, you can have all the physical attributes you need, but you have to have the full package, the mental, uh, the mental, the physical, the, the skill. It's all got to come together. And the, even the spiritual part of it comes in. And it, uh, but that day is when it really, really hit for me where I, I became a world caliber fighter that day. If I had to pinpoint, I may have gone off on your question a little bit, but there we have it. No, that's all right. Tangents are great. Welcomed, in fact, on this show. Hey, thank you, brother. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. Sure, sure. So we're starting to get a picture of who you are, of what makes you tick, of what has drawn you and kept you in the martial arts and kickboxing for so long. But outside of that, what do you like to do? Do you have any hobbies, any pursuits that you, you enjoy know, that don't involve kicking people in the head? Yeah, you know, I love to work out. I love to work out. You know, I have people now that say, I need to get in shape. And I say, this is great because I love to work out. I like lifting weights. I like shooting basketball. I love to surf. I love to surf. I still ride my motocross bike. I love that. Um, I have a mountain bike I ride. I still box a little bit and kick some and hit the bag and, and work out because I I love working out and do some swimming. But um, surfing, motocross, probably the biggest biggest thrills for me. What is it about surfing? I'm you know in various parts of my life now I'm starting to get exposed to people that have either been surfing for, for a little while or or you know for a long time and there seems to be something very different about it versus everything else that I know, just the way people talk about it. For you, I mean, what is it about surfing that you enjoy? Surfing, I was telling somebody a story just the other day. It was a storm out, and this was in uh, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. It may have been Myrtle Beach. This has been a while. This has been a long time ago, back even when I was only been surfing for a few years. There was a storm out. So these waves, probably eight-foot waves, and it was, uh, I was out on it. We used to, oh, it was at Myrtle Beach. Cause that's where we used to go jump over. We'd climb over. You know, whenever a storm comes, they would shut down the pier. There would be no fishing. So the pier guys, they would just close up. They'd be gone. So we would go out and climb over the fence and climb over the building and, and walk out to the end of the pier to keep from having to paddle out through all these storm waves. What it, cause sometimes it'll take you 30 minutes to get out through all these storm waves. So we would go out over the pier and jump off the end of the pier and then, paddle out into the waves just to save us from having to paddle through all that storm surge but uh i was out on a day like that and the wave is you just rising up with the wave and then coming back down when the rave would go over you and it's really that particular day it was majestic man it was it was almost holy because mother nature's as sweet as the ocean is and it's pretty to look at but when the storm comes it changes everything and it was just it was just, it was just like, uh, it was godly to be sitting out on that water on a surfboard surfing, but just being, being in it. You can hear the waves breaking around, the wind whipping around, and but it, it is uh, majestic, man. It was, it was that, that was one feeling that I'll never forget. That was the highlight of my surfing career right there. And me and one of my buddies, Cal Johnson's, uh, been to Costa Rica a couple of times surfing, and that was. That was a big highlight of my surfing career. There's some great waves out there, but surfing is you get a little exercise and and just that, it's that nature, man. There's something to that nature that draws you to it. Mm. 
That would be that would be my answer to that. And I can't answer. I guess you just have to do it. But and, it, and you know, the first time you, it's just like anything. You practice a little bit, you do it, you practice. Then when the first time you get up on a wave, oh wow, it's just it's pure excitement and fun and joy and all that good stuff. And then mm-hmm. and as you learn to ride a wave, it just changes everything. It's it's a it's a cool sport. It really is. It's a cool sport. Now I don't know if we're stumbling onto an answer to you know your turned question back to me about why kickboxing, why you would like it. But the three things that you've spoken of kickboxing, surfing and motocross, the the thing that I see them having in common is if you're not intently focused. You can get really hurt. You've got yeah. to, you've got to be present. You've got to know what you're doing and, and really pay attention. Well, I, I, I go with that on motocross, uh, surfing. I always say, you know, yeah, you, you know, I've been hitting the head with a surfboard, but basically, you know, you're going to fall in the water. But there have been times, you know, I've surfed out in Hawaii before, and there's coral reef you have to worry about. They're pretty shallow, so you have to be careful out there. But yeah, you can get hurt, and I've been tossed around in some waves a little bit for sure. But I would think surfing would be the lesser of the three. But sure. Would, yeah, you you could get, and there's creatures out in the water that could do something to you, I guess. <laughs> right, right. Cer- certainly a little bit more risk with surfing than, yeah. you know, basketball yeah. or... But you're or, right you know, on motocross. Reading. That is for sure, man. On motocross, you have got to be. If you've got, if you've got female troubles or money problems or whatever, when you're really dialing in on a motocross bike, it's everything is right there. That is for sure. You yeah. have got to be right there. And uh, whatever else is going on, you can think about that when this is over. Especially when there's some other bikes around you, like you're really, like you're really racing somebody. If somebody's trying to pass you, or you're trying to pass somebody. It's yeah, it's pretty intense, and it's it's that's a that's a blast right there. That's what that is, just a blast. You get yeah. two or three people that are about the same skill levels racing one another. Oh man, it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> so you've talked, you've mentioned a couple times about troubles and bringing your troubles and having to ignore them. And I'd like you to tell us about a time in your life where something didn't go right. I mean, you talked a little bit about that first world title opportunity, so let's take that one out of the mix. But sometime where something didn't go well, and you were able to use what you've learned from your martial arts training to move through that time. You know, I've I've had a pretty charmed life, so I haven't had too many setbacks thus far. You know, I've lost some friends and whatnot, as we all have. But um, next to that fight... Next to that fight, I I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. I mean, if something comes up later. Okay. But um, yeah, we can come back to that for sure. Yeah. yeah I've, I've, uh, fortunately, I can say I haven't had too many setbacks. Any, anything that really sticks out, it just makes it. Oh yeah, that no. So other than that, losing okay. that fight, that would. I mean, we've all had our ups and downs. Don't get me wrong, but nothing really drastic, you know. All right. Other than that fight. Right if you that. had to pick one person that was the most influential on your time through the martial arts, who would that be? You know, I like Sugar Ray Leonard. I pulled for him, and I know he wasn't a martial artist, but he was a boxer. But um, and this, I would have to say my brother was more the most influential person. I don't know if you say, uh, you know, I spent time I trained with Joe Lewis. When Joe Lewis was first making his comeback, he uh, was working out. We were both working out at a Fort Bragg gym and uh, in North Carolina here. So that was that was cool having him there and around. We became pals there. And uh, But I would have to say the biggest influence on would have to be my brother Bruce, and he is not. Tell, a, tell us about Bruce. Bruce played. He's uh, he played a little country, progressive country music band back in the day, and uh, he had a nice following. He was, he was well thought of. Had a nice, a great band, and I think he was a little bit ahead of his time. He's kind of like the country people are now. He was kind of like that, you know, twenty years ago. So um, I think he was a little bit ahead of his time. But um, 
he got saved, I can't remember exactly, probably eight years ago, something like that. He got saved, and now he's an evangelist. He goes all over the place telling his story and still plays music and has a couple of Christian CDs and that type thing. And But he was... Uh, he actually did a little boxing with me as well. He actually started kind of when I started, but he was doing the music thing. So um, he actually had a couple of amateur fights, and uh, but he, we were just we were just like-minded guys back in the day. We we were tight, and we're still tight. We're you know he was he was a big influence on me then, and he's still a great influence on me now. But he was he's just good people. One of the people you like to be around and. He was he was always good. He worked my corner when we were where he could get to him. Like uh, some fights, he you know like the Las Vegas fight, he couldn't make. And whenever he was there, anywhere close, he would be in my corner. So I would have to go. I'd have to save my brother Bruce. It's nice when those family ties can can offer support and. I don't know that I would say it's a recurring thing, but it's you're certainly not the first one to name an immediate family member. It's often mm-hmm. a parent and just but to have that support from such a close perspective mm-hmm. I think is pretty important when someone's gonna compete at, at the level that you did, certainly um, you know, to have that foundation of the people that you love and you trust to know that they're going to be there for you and they support what you're doing. I mean that's that's got to be pretty meaningful. Oh, absolutely. And even my mother, man, you could. My mother went, to, and I know that had to be hard on her, but she would uh, go to my fights, and you could hear on some tapes. You could hear her in the tape. Get him, you know. You could hear her pulling for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I have another brother that's, that's his name's Sammy, and he he would come to some fights as well, and he's he's a good influence as well. So clearly, competing is something that you enjoyed. I mean, yes, we, I mean we've heard about a number of things where you enjoyed competition. Yeah, it's starting to look that way, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um so let's you know, let's dig dig in a little bit to your, your kickboxing career. All right. How how long were you active? I mean, you mentioned retirement mm, you know, I had a few about years a ago. Sixteen year career, my whole okay. fighting career. I started amateur boxing and um I got kind of a late start in it. Maybe that's good. Maybe it's bad, but it worked out for me. But um, I was very athletic anyway. And even back when when I when I told you my brothers gave up the boxing gloves and I commandeered them, and me and my neighborhood guys would box. And it was funny. Even back then, I would box one guy, and then he'd take the gloves I'll put on, and I'd box him. And then he'd take, the, and I would box. So even I had a little natural a little knack for it, even back then. I think my conditioning was always, and that was one of the things that helped me in my kickboxing career, is uh, is one of the things that people knew that if you're going to fight Dale Fry, you got to be ready to go 12 rounds because he's going to be just as good in the 12th round as he is in the first round. So you got to be ready for that. And where that came from, I don't know. But um, but I noticed, you know, when I think back, even, even in boxing and you know, when we were 12, 13 years old, I guess, you know, I had I had some stamina. I had a little knack for it even then. So, What did you do to stay so competitive? Or that's not the right word. To, to keep your, your cardiovascular fitness that good that you could... You know, I've never heard anybody talk about going 12 rounds and, and being anywhere close to as good in that 12th round. Right. So what was it you were doing that I, – I bet I'm not the only one listening to that going, man, I want to know his secret. Right. You know, there's nothing but hard work right there. And it's um, – like say, for one, I enjoy I enjoyed the work. And I enjoyed the physical part of it in the competition. And I, I enjoyed it. But, you know, when I, when I didn't fight, I was playing basketball or I was – uh you know, you know, I would take jogs just periodically, and when I when I wasn't fighting, I had a regimen that like like a, a no, I would go shadow box three rounds, hit the heavy bag three rounds, speed bag three rounds, and jump rope three rounds. So that's twelve rounds, and that's just uh that was just my kind of I did that pretty just not every day, but 
probably five times a week, even when I wasn't fighting. So, Mm -hmm. and you know, once I became a world champion, I only fought once or twice a year then. And uh, so I had more time and I I was just always, I was just in great shape, man. And usually after a fight, even the next day, I would go out and play basketball or do something, mess around. I had one fight. I fought a kid by the name of Gamma. No, his name was Jimmy Tapia. He was the number four contender from Denver, Colorado. And I defended my title against him in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And we went 12 rounds. And he was, I was a little better than him, but he, I had to deal with him for the whole 12 rounds. He was steady coming the whole 12 rounds. And even in the 11th round, he had a good spinning back fist. He was knocking people out with a spinning back fist. And every time he would throw, he kind of gave it away, so I would, I, I could see it coming. He kind of gave it, so I would just duck. But in the 11th round, he threw the spinning back fist, and behind that spinning back fist, he came with a back leg round kick, hit me right in the forehead, knocked me down, took an eight count, got up. Fortunately, I was pretty close to the end of the round, and then went back, beat him in the 12th round. Basically, he probably won two rounds, and I won ten rounds in that whole fight. But he definitely won the eleventh round. So, uh, and that was just because I was in the physical condition I was. I was able to recuperate that, recuperate from that, and I have to attribute my physical fitness for that. And that was one fight where I didn't have, I didn't get sick, or you know, from losing weight, I, I was, I was as good as I could probably get that day. And. Um, but that that was the only only fight I ever had where the next day I just kind of laid around, watched football on TV, and just just kind of laid around. But every other fight besides that one, I was out doing so. You know, it didn't really didn't really affect me too bad. Really? Wow, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So I, during during your title career days, you know, defending your titles and going for titles where you were only fighting once or twice a year. What changed in the way that you would prepare? Not just, you know, a few weeks out from the fight, but how how was your training, I guess, better question. How was your training different during those years than when you might be fighting amateur and I would assume having, you know, four, five, six fights in a year? Well, I had 10 amateur boxing matches and my first kickboxing match was a pro bout. And I fought the North Carolina champion, my very first pro bout. And um, his name Billy Inman, and we're still pals to this day. We talk on the phone a couple times a month. We're still pals. He he didn't like me for a long time after that because that's the first time he'd ever been beaten. But uh, we're great <laughs> pals now, man. So he's a good guy. But that, my very first kickboxing fight was uh, against the North Carolina champion. And I won that title that day in a five-round fight. But the thing about it was, you know, we we would sometimes fight two fights in a month, maybe three sometimes. Wow. Because, but they were, you know, four- and five-round fights. So it didn't take that much out of you, you know. But when you when you do a 12-round fight, it just takes a lot more. There's more going into it. And a lot of times there's more coming out of it. You just have to prepare a little bit differently. You know, to train for a five-round fight, Train for a twelve round fight. It's just a different ball of wax. And and Jeremy, when I first started fighting, I had to kind of graduate graduate to this twelve because I used to watch these guys fighting. When I first started fighting, they were fighting like boxers were fighting fifteen rounds. It's like man, it's all I can do to get three rounds of amateur boxing in. Then it went to kickboxing. It's like man, it was like four and five round fights. But it was all we could do to get get to five rounds. And I'd be exhausted after the fact. But then as your training picks up and you get, you just, the more you do it, that's the whole graduating. You know, you just kind of go from one grade to the next. You kind of graduate because it's, it's not something you could just jump out and do. You can't just go out and do a 12-round fight right off the bat. It just doesn't have, you have to work your way up to that. And as you well know, you know, fighting really is not a natural thing. Like if you get two street guys out here fighting and they wrestle around, for like 30 seconds, they're both exhausted, you know, in just 30 seconds, because fighting is just, to me, it's just not a natural thing. So it took a while 
to be able obviously you're training where you you're doing when I was doing my three rounds on a heavy bag and three rounds three rounds everything it's just my little everyday conditioning workout you have to go to six rounds on doing these so I could have a heavy bag six seven eight rounds on a heavy bag so everything increases your sparring increases your you jump more rope your runs a little bit longer or you, you know you're doing sprints or whatever everything everything increases and my trainer at that time Bill McDonald was great about having you peek out. He would work, you know, you just, and he would set me down at the beginning of the deal. He would say, all right, here's what we have. This this weight, we're going to be going five rounds. Then we're going to go to seven. Then we're going to go to nine or whatever. You know, he increased it, gradually increased it. And by the time, like a week out, you're in peak shape. And and he was good. But he knows, and every, I hope every, everybody knows, you can't, you can't stay in that peak shape for an extended period of time. It's not healthy. It's not good for you. I mean, it's cool. It feels good to be in that kind of shape, but you can't stay in that kind of shape for an extended period of time because he was good about getting me to that point and then a couple of days rest before the fight and then bam, and when the fight comes, it's, it's, it's all... So there's a science to it. There's a method to the madness, you know, and there's a science to it. Yeah. Yeah, it's something that I've heard other people talk about and I know... Certainly, I've never done anything like that where I've been structuring towards a particular event. I mean, you know, outside maybe testing or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I certainly know that, you know, I'll get to a certain point and maybe back off. You know, just life keeps me out of the gym, out of training for a few days. And then, you know, you go back four, five, six days later after you're all rested up and you feel like a million bucks. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy how that rest works out. Definitely something to that. And, you know, even flexibility-wise, you know, have, you'll be during training, you're stretching, you're stretching, and then after a couple of days, a few days rest, man, your stretches just go out. It's crazy. Yeah. I said, man, I'm more flexible now than I was, you know, four days ago. It's crazy how that is. Now, you've talked about boxing a few times, and it's really clear that you have a, I guess I could say a reverence for boxers and for boxing. Yes. I Why? Was that was my first love, I guess, is that's what I first started. You know, we used to do karate. When I sparred in karate, I liked it, and it was, you know, we had to kind of do the light contact and stuff. And um, when I first started started boxing, it was uh, it was like a white guy that was good white. He could he could do well, you know, he could do. And a lot of times these these managers per se would scoop these white guys up and give them some easy wins and they'll be 10 and 0 and then throw them in with somebody, even a champion maybe, and they'll get wiped out, but it makes some money. The manager makes money off of them and that type thing. So I never, I never got, I was kind of looking to go into boxing to begin with, but I met Bill McDonald and he asked me to come down to help out his kickboxers with some boxing. And I did and there was a girl there that was going to do a karate tournament that following weekend, and she didn't have anybody to spar with. So I said, I'll kick around with you. And then when he saw that I could kick, he said, man, you gotta, you need to get into this kickboxing, this and that and the other. And I said, well, I, I think I'm okay with just two hands coming at me right now. But then <laughs> one thing led to another, and I really didn't find a manager per se that I felt good about doing business with. So I, I said, I believe I will try this kickboxing. And uh, at first, they'll say, you know, when kickboxing first took off, you were either a kicker or you came from the boxing background or you came from the karate background. And I obviously kind of had a little bit of both, but I was a much better boxer than I was a kicker. And then as it went, my kicks, as you kind of go up the ladder, especially when you get to that upper echelon, you have got to be good at both. You know, when you get into the top ten, you have got to be good at kicking and boxing. As simple as that. It's just like the UFC guys now. Some of them have they're good boxers. Some of them are good wrestlers. Some of them are good kickers. But as they get better, you get to a point you have to be good at all of that stuff. And that's the way it was in kickboxing. And that's the way I, you know, it was either when I was fighting, that was especially beginning. I was either boxing or I was kicking. It was another box kick, box, you know, punch kick, punch kick. But later on, I was able to mix it up, but not at the beginning of my career. Hmm. But I'll still say I I had a a big affinity for boxing, that's for sure. I have have a huge respect for boxers. To this day, that was was my first love, for sure. When you're working out now, 
you know, how much of it is, is boxing, how much of it is kicking? 80% of it is boxing. Really? Okay. Yep. So that, that tells us a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But I still kick, you know, there's more, like there's not a lot of kickboxers right here. Now everybody's doing the, a lot of people are doing the, the ground game and all that. And I've gotten into some of that as well and enjoy that as well. But, and I can, I can see the parallel between the, the UFC stuff and the kickboxing back in the day, because like I said, some guys are either this, that, or the other. And then as you get to it, you got to be able to, you have to be able to good, be able to be good on the ground, kicking and boxing. So I, I see now a I've, lot of parallels between the two. I've asked this of some of the, the guests that we've had, mm-hmm. uh, and I don't think we've done it on air, so I'm not going to betray their confidence, but we've had some that, started in kickboxing, you know, decades ago. And I've asked them, you know, had mixed martial arts been available to you at that time, do you think you would have gone that route instead? And they've said yes. Would I asked the same question of you. If MMA had been something you could have participated in rather than kickboxing, would you have chosen it? I'm sure I would have been right in the middle of it, I'm sure. Because I had to kick in... I mean, it would have been right up my wheelhouse because I had the background, the wrestling background, even though some wrestling stuff doesn't work in, in grappling, you know, it's, but it, you, you get the same, you get the concept, you know, um, yeah. I had the wrestling background, I had the kicking background and the boxing background. Yeah. I think it would have been a pretty natural fit for me and I'm sure I'd have been right there. And I'm glad, I'm glad it wasn't around because I don't like, I got cut a few times sparring and in some fights with elbows, getting hit with elbow. And I'm going to tell you, when you get hit with elbow, it's just, it, it's going to happen. You know, it's, it's amazing when people do get hit with an elbow and they don't get cut. It's amazing to me. But, um, uh, I've been cut a few times and, and accidentally getting hit with an elbow. But, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking, man, I'd have been cut up. You know, when I'm, I'm in a way, I'm glad it wasn't around because it's, it's a rough sport. I mean, it's rough, probably no rougher than what we did, but, just so the elbows and knees just add a whole new dimension yeah. to it. Sure do. And but it but it's fighting is is fighting and that whole competitive. I'm sure I'd have been right there. Yeah. yeah. So you've mentioned some some big names. You know, well, I mean, you mentioned one really big name, right, Joe Lewis, that you had the opportunity to work with him. And you know, you and I have talked a little bit offline. You've mentioned some names and. I'm curious if you had the chance to work with someone that you didn't and we'll open it up. It could be somebody from, you know, long ago that's passed on or somebody that's still alive today. Who would you want to train with? Well, everybody, I think everybody was probably, and I guarantee you when you ask this people, you've asked this question before, right? Oh, yeah. We ask this of every guest. I'll bet 90% of the people say Bruce Lee. Is that right? Not quite 90, but it's it's probably right. 60 to 70%. Yeah, it's a, it's a big chunk. You know, um, hmm, I, I can't think. You know, I've got a buddy of mine. You know who James Bonecrusher Smith is? He's a boxer. He was a heavyweight champion in the world at one time. He lost his title to Mike Tyson back when Mike oh, Tyson okay. was his big day. And he's from my hometown, and we're, we're still friends to this day. We we hang out, we chat on the phone and play golf together and stuff like that. But uh, he was a good guy. You know, he was a good, he, say, a mentor. But, he, you know, I looked up to him because he was he was what I wanted to be, you know. So I looked up to him, as, and he he's a good guy. But who would I want to train with? Man, I had some good guys that we trained with. We, one of your guests, Kevin Hudson and Brendan Carpenter and my buddy Randy Ballard and Tony Googe and Ronnie Copeland. We had, we had a good group of guys that were, to this day that we fight, we fight, and we spar each other, but we are like brothers and um, to this day even. And, um, and I think that bond that bond of fighting with somebody, it does something. I don't know if you've ever gotten this before, Jeremy, but it's something when you, when you get in the trench with somebody and beat on somebody and they beat on you, it, it kind of develops a little bond with you. As crazy as that sounds, but, uh, you know, nobody we heard but, that. 
Go ahead. We we heard that from Kyoshi Kevin Hudson when he was on. Mm -hmm. uh, his episode came out um, just a couple weeks ago now when we're recording this. It'll be a few weeks mm -hmm. prior to when your episode comes out. But he said the very same thing. And I think we even pulled a quote about that out from that episode. We always, we always do that and list out a quote at the beginning of the episode. And it's something that I haven't experienced in that way. You know, I've certainly built bonds with the people that I've trained with, but sure. there seems to be a really strong component from the, I don't want to call it violence, but the, the, the physical pain yes. that you're yep. sharing with someone yep. else. Yep. And I'll tell you on a bigger level, you can, you can look at a football team and I'm sure some of these football, when these guys get together, they're thrown together in a group. And they work hard. They work. They work. And they they become friends. They become brothers. And, you know, at as, as a bigger level, this whole black and white thing or whatever, I think when you, when you get people together, regardless whether they're black or white, and you, you've got the same goal going on and you work really, you just work at that goal, it brings you together. Just like you look at a football team and, Black, there's no black and white on the football team. You know, these guys are a team. And just like right. in my in my sport, we had even though kickboxing is a is an individual sport, you have a team behind you. You know, you have a team your managers and your my brothers and and your sparring partners and just so happens I had some good guys, Kevin Hudson one of them, and there was a a core group of your your these guys are you're all after the same goal and um and I, some of my best friends have been black guys. And Demetrius Oaktree Everett, who was a heavyweight kickboxing champion of the world back in the day, back when kickboxing first started, he was one of my training partners. He was in the gym where I was. And uh, Curtis Crandall, who became a light heavyweight world champion, was in my gym. And we worked out together. We ran together. We sparred together. And that and those, those guys, to this day, are, are like brothers to me. And, and the other guys with including Kevin Hudson and 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 that's all I can understand is is we worked hard together and we fought each other and it's, it's some kind of a bond that goes which I would think like being in the military when you go through that whole boot camp with somebody you kind of get a bond with them you know you get a certain love for them and trust for them and all that good stuff so well, we're mm -hmm. getting deep now brother well yeah that that's what we do here <laughs> all right <laughs> Therapy you don't have to pay for. There and you other go. people get to listen. Right? We all scratching the surface, aren't we? That's right. But but there you have it, you know. And, <clears throat> but there's a certain brotherhood for those people that uh that you've been in the ditches with and, and I don't know if you could get it by just sparring with somebody one time or something, you know, and, and I'm forcing friends with some of the guys that I've fought with and over over years, you know, I fought a guy by the name of David Hamilton who lived in North Carolina and we, he started coming to our gym later on, and we were kind of cutting eyes at each other. And fortunately, I was able to beat him. He was a great fighter, but we ended up becoming friends later on, you know. And it's, uh, I actually worked his corner in a couple of fights, and uh, we became good friends later on. But, uh, but what's that like to shift from having the intent to hurt someone? And then have it into, or, or do you back all that out? I mean, what, what's that transition like? It's not something I've ever experienced. Well, I'll fight with you, someone, I, then become their friend. Yeah, with that particular that particular guy, when we fought, I knew he was a good fighter, and we were in the same weight class and from the same state, and a couple hours away. You know, eventually we were going to have to fight. And um, then once we did. Um, it was probably a year later when he came to my gym. It was funny. We were down there look, doing stretches, and I was I was kind of stealing a peep at him, and he was doing the same to me. <laughs> it was it was funny. We actually talked about it later. But it is a weird thing. But it, it, there again, it's just time over time. You know, we sparred a couple of times, and then it just – he came to my as, – as the more he came, the more – we you know, it just – the fight we just kind of forgot about. We never talked about it. It's a done deal. We sparred several t several times, and, um, and he had a fight up in Atlantic City where my manager couldn't go. So I went with him and worked his corner, 
and it's it's just like an, an unspoken thing. We never we never even talked about it. It's just a matter of time. Just kind of just kind of heals any wounds we may have had or any transgressions we might have from each other. But it's mm. just time, I guess. But I'll tell you, when it comes to fighting, because I'm a pretty easygoing guy, when it came to fighting, when I first started kickboxing, it would take me a couple of rounds to get into it. But then later on, I kind of, Jeremy, I would, when I, if I had a world title fight, I might be jumping ship on it here, I would, I was always in pretty good shape. But my first two weeks, I, it would take me six weeks to get ready for a 12 round fight. In the first two weeks, I would be training. But I still might go out and, you know, go on a date or something like that. But in those last four weeks, I was I lived a pretty secluded life. I didn't go out, didn't mess with women. I don't drink or do drugs anyway, so I didn't have to worry about that. But it was all those those last four weeks leading up to that fight was was we everything I did pretty much everything I ate, everything I did had had that fight was it, it was it was it was the ultimate sacrifice for a month, a, a, one month of going into this fight. Yeah, I'd go to the mall, walk around or something like that maybe, but everything I did because of making weight, almost like everything I put in my mouth had something to do. Is how is this going to affect my training? How's this? You know, and it was mm-hmm. 100% into that fight that I had coming up. So I was able to kind of get mean and stuff because when you've been – secluded for a month it's a lot easier to get mean and um and that's what worked for me because i had a pretty easy going you know friendly personality anyway so i got to switch over into the fight mode so it was a it was a little bit of a transition for me but it was a lot easier for sure yeah i don't know if i could do it right i could sure i could do it right now but it was easier to do when you've been Locked up for about a month. I mean, not locked up per se, but you know, everything's. I mean, I stayed at the gym. Later on, I started staying with my buddies, my buddy Randy's in his apartment. But you know, for the first several years, I stayed at the gym. I had a little. I mean, it was hardcore, man. I stayed at the gym. I had a little room in the back of the gym. You were so, focused. Yeah, that, that's what it was. It's focused. It was one hundred percent. Absolutely. So, so, a couple of lighter questions now, and then we'll we'll kind of get right. back into it. How about martial arts movies? Are there any of those that we like to ask all of our guests if they have any favorite movies? Mm-hmm. You got any? Bruce Lee movies. Um, you know, when you were talking about martial arts, I, ha- I have to say that uh, uh, Chuck Norris was, uh, I, I, I would, wouldn't like to hang out with him a little bit. And I had the chance to meet him a couple of times. One of the fight in El Paso, Texas. And one out at Las Vegas, Nevada, I met him a couple of times. Super nice guy. Both times I met him, and and I've heard that from a lot of different people. But what yeah. makes me stand, what makes him stand out for me is, is I fought a guy by the name of Troy Dorsey, who we are friends now as well, and uh, in El Paso, Texas. And I'm coming from North Carolina sea level, and El Paso has a little altitude to it. And he beat me an eight-round decision. But after the third round, it was like, man, I'm going to just try to keep him getting knocked down. I couldn't breathe, man. I had no idea they had altitude in El Paso, Texas. But um, he's a great guy, but he won the fight. But Chuck Norris, as I was leaving the ring, Chuck was there, and he made an effort. He made a, He saw me coming out of the ring, and he made an effort. He came over there and hugged my neck. And uh, that always meant a lot to me, and I, I really admired him for that. And, I mean, he's, he's a, a great guy. Great guy, and uh, yeah, yeah, without a doubt, he's a class act. We, yeah, we've he's heard a that class act, man. But I'll, I'll never several people on this he show. made it. He made an effort, and he, obviously, he, just, he knew I just lost a fight, which is not good. But he made an effort to come over there, hug my neck, to you know, wish me the best. And the next time, several, I know he won't remember me, but several years later, I saw him out in Vegas, and he's very friendly, very approachable. And uh, I think people see that now that movie Walker, Texas Ranger, the television series, I think people see that. He may not be the best actor in the world, but he he's a he's a good guy and I think that comes through on camera. You know what I mean? He's not a bad actor, don't get me wrong, but per se acting. And I'll tell you, um Brandon Lee, 
was a was a class act. I did a movie with him called The Crow, and he was a class act. Now I never got to work out with him or anything like, but we spent some time together. And 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 I I don't know if we're talking about movie stuff yet, but I have a good story. Yeah, let's now. let's yeah let's talk about movie stuff. I mean that's okay, a piece well, that we I really haven't movie, dug into. Now I did a movie called The Crow with Brandon Lee, which he got killed in. Right. Before that, somewhere along the lines, we were sitting around on on set. And I had the chance. He was just a class act, Jeremy. He's just a cool dude. And I had the chance to walk up there and I said, "Look, I may not get a chance to tell you, but I just want to tell you, you are one. You, you're just a cool guy." And I want to say, "Man, it's, it's awesome to see that you're just a cool guy." And uh, bless his heart, he said, "Hey, you're you're the same way, Dale." I said, "Yeah, but I'm not star of the show, so that's the big difference here." But uh, he was just the one. Just, just one cool guy. It was a tragedy that happened to him, but he was one, one, one good guy. That was somebody I believe I'd like to have hung out with. That's for sure. He's a class act. What other films have you been in? Obviously, my first movie was a movie Cyborg with Jean Claude Van Damme, and mm-hmm. uh, I had a great time. Looking back now, I've done about ninety movies versus and television things. But that was my first movie, and people say, "What's your favorite movie?" And Cyborg was definitely one of them. And because um, I guess it was a new experience, had had great fun doing some cool stuff, meeting some nice people. And uh, if you have any female listeners, the movie The Notebook with uh, Ryan Gosling, I doubled him at the very beginning of the movie. This guy likes this girl, and she's riding a Ferris wheel with another guy. And he runs and jumps on the fair, so as it's going, that'll be me. And then, oh, neat. Yeah, I've seen that movie. Have you seen that movie? Cool. I have, I have, yeah. And then he's hanging off the Ferris wheel saying, come on, go out with me. Do you remember that part? Yeah. Uh, he's hanging that was off you. the Ferris wheel. That was me. He did some <laughs> stuff as well, but he, whenever he sees somebody free hanging off the Ferris wheel, that'll be me. If you remember, she actually reaches up, undoes his pants. He does, he's hanging off the Ferris wheel with his pants hanging around his ankle. That'll be me. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. So that that was a fun movie as well, and I, they're all pretty good, you know. They're all pretty pretty good, but some some are better than others. Those those are a couple of my. The Crow was the Crow was an interesting movie, that's for sure. Met some nice people there. Did some cool stuff. What was your role in that movie? The Crow. Um, there's a big table of bad guys sitting around, and I'm one of those bad guys, and Brandon Lee comes and stands up on the table. He has a little dialogue with the main bad guy. He wants somebody who's going to kill somebody. And our main bad guy has a little, like I said, they chat for a little bit, and then our main bad, bad guy said, man, shoot him. And there's probably 12 stunt guys. They're all stunt. We all shoot him. And he falls off this table, and I walk up there and put my hand on the table and look where he should be, and I look under the table, and I said, man, he's gone. And then he shoots me in the head, and then he commences to killing everybody else on the table so that was my part in that movie and i did some other stuff as well in it but that was part you know if you see me that movie is a classic i mean that's oh it is it's a, a lot of people have, have spoken of that as a, a little cult movie terribly type. underrated cult yeah. film yeah well i'll tell you a part at the very beginning of the movie i'm gonna tell you, you talk about somebody digging deep this is cold now in the very beginning of the movie he comes out of a grave he, it's, I don't know if you have you seen this movie. It's been a while. Yeah, me too as well. But he comes out of a grave, and this done in in Wilmington, North Carolina. But when he comes out of his grave, it's cold that day. I have a hooded sweatshirt on and a jacket on over this, so it's cold out. You know, it's cold. And this cat's got on nothing but a pair of blue jeans. And I think he put pulls on some boots or something like that. But he comes out of this grave with, with just a like a pair of old blue ragged out blue jeans. And then he comes out, he does his scene, he walks in, he does his scene, he does whatever it is. And then it, after the scene, they cut. He's still walking around and nothing. He goes to the director, hey, you know, you're doing this, doing that. He's just standing around and and nothing. You know what I mean? Like no shirt. No, usually you have these wardrobe people come throw a robe over him or something like that. But he he was cool, man. So he had some uh, he had some mental fortitude going on. I don't know if I'm sure that came from his background in martial arts or something, but... It was like, wow. It, to this day, it's amazing to me how he could do that. 
because I mean I hate the cold anyway. But he, you know, he was from I think California, living in California at the time. Yep. I'm surely he wasn't used to it. But uh, he had his zen going that day, man. I tip my hat to him <laughs> for it. Have you worked with anybody else that you know really jumps out at you? I mean, you've been in quite a few things. You know, um, I've been with I've been with some. I've done a show with John Travolta, and he I, he's a nice guy. I did a movie with uh, Mel Gibson, super nice guy. I thought he was just just very affable guy, very approachable, but super nice guy. Bruce Willis, Die Hard Part Three, Die Hard with a Vengeance is called. Just a just a very approachable, nice nice individual, and. Uh, and Jean Claude and I had a, had a good time on the set. We you know a lot of people don't like Jean Claude. Some people love him. Some people don't. But uh, I got along with him great. We had a great time. And um, but I did a movie with Kevin Costner, and he was he was pretty friendly as well. So every big time actor that I've ever been around, I mean these these are some big names. They've been in very sure. Friendly. Yeah, these uh, are A list actors for yeah, sure. Yeah, A list guys that they could be lost had if they wanted to and probably get away with it, but they were. Uh, I'm glad they weren't, you know. So I tell you that Ryan Gosling in the Notebook, one of the nicest guys I've ever met in my life, and uh, just just a great guy. And the girl that played his girlfriend was a sweet girl as well, Rachel McAdams. She was also very yeah. very sweet. But he was he was just a cool guy. Good. Are you at all a reader? Yeah. Any martial arts related books? That jump out at you? No, I, I have a motocross action magazine that I read. I read Reader's Digest every month. And uh, I'm not, I don't subscribe to any martial arts magazine. But, um, you know, I, I'll pick up an article here and there. I read Kevin Hudson's book he put out, Hit the Mark. Yeah, I'm working on it right now. Are you? you did, I read that. Yeah, yeah. The other day. That was great. Well, was very well read. So yeah. you're in the middle of reading it now? Yep. Yeah. About a third of the way. Oh, good. He was nice enough to send me a copy. Good, good deal. Yeah, that's that's a nice little read. Pretty easy reading. It's got some good pointers in it, and uh, he mentioned my name in there a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> he talks about uh, he talks about in the book. He's talking about skin in the gloves. You know what that is? You know what it means? Skin in the gloves mean? I don't know. Whenever you, and it's old boxing days. You really don't have to do it nowadays because usually, like in big fights, they bring brand new gloves. Some of these old old boxing gloves we used to use, they'd be kind of a little bit worn, you know, so you would uh he explains it in the book, but you kind of you kind of tie it, you kind of tie it up towards the knuckles and you just kind of you just kind of pull the leather down so when you ball your fist up, it'll be nice and tight. It's actually illegal now in the boxing circles and all that, but really you don't need to do it now because the, the gloves are brand new, you know, but when you have these old gloves, it's, and that's what we used to use back in our day sometimes until we got to that championship level. Some of those early mm-hmm. fights, we used some old worn-out gloves. But it's just a matter of, it's just a way of making the gloves fit nice and tight on your hand. So when you did hit somebody, you could really tell it. Hmm. So, you're you're still active. I mean, you're not fighting competitively anymore but you're still training yeah i mean, yeah, still I, I mean you, you love it you, so i mean you could be doing a lot of other things with your your time but what is it what is it about i mean i understand you enjoy it but what is it about your training that you really enjoy hmm. you know i well i hope i don't cross the line here i compare it to women I'll say it's just like women. Every once in a while, if you hadn't done it in a while, you just need to kind of go out there and get hit on a little bit. You know, it just, you just need, you don't need a lot. You just need a little bit. You know, just go it. And I wish I could answer that. I don't know, but it's, it's, uh, I guess when this stuff gets in your blood, it's hard to get out. That, that would be, that would be the quote I would use right there. Once it gets in your blood, it's hard to get out. And you know what's great, Jeremy, what keeps me in, in the sport now is I referee fights now. And that's kickboxing, boxing, and MMA. So that really keeps me in the loop. And I've been going to a gym down here. My buddy Roy has been teaching me some uh, 
some ground game, some grappling and whatnot, and uh, great teacher. So, and and I've learned to enjoy that. You know, mixed martial arts first came out, and it was all good until it got on the ground. And I said, man, I like seeing box and kick. I love that. But then once they got to the it was kind of boring. But then, now that I know a little bit more about it, I can appreciate it. I enjoy it. You know, I, I can watch it, and I appreciate it when they're on the ground because I know what's going on, you know. And there's a lot going on with that ground game. Have you fooled with it at all yet, Jeremy? Um, I... I've got a little bit of judo, a little bit of jujitsu in my background, but not, you know, not as a MMA, you know, combination. Right. I like staying on my feet. There you go. <laughs> I'm. You know, my buddy Randy uh, says these guys always talk about MMA. So, oh, 90% of the fights end up on the ground. The 90% of the fights end up on the ground. My buddy Randy said, yep. But guess what? 100% of them start standing up. So I, said, I love that. Yeah, hundred percent of them gonna, start standing up. So that's that's a good quote right there. Going to use that. Mm-hmm. So what else is keeping you going? You got any goals? I mean, do you, do you ever get the itch to get back in the ring and compete? You know, it was funny when I first um, when I first retired. Yeah, you you kind of miss it a little bit, but then again. It didn't take long because I had a good career. You know, I had a pretty good career, and I had some uh, some hip injury that kind of I probably would still be fighting if it wasn't for that. But um, I had to get out because I had a little hip wearing out on me. And uh, but it, a lot of times people would say you miss it, and I, at first maybe a little bit, but now not so much because I had a nice career. I did did it all. You know what I mean? And and it's it's a lot. It's a lot to go in to put in to put that kind of effort into a fight. It's a lot goes into it, and like I say, I held the world title for six years, and um, it, it. I think I had I'd done it enough. Does that make sense? Absolutely I, I does. Enough. So I, I may have missed it just a just a little bit right at first, but really not so much. I, I mean, I think I pretty much ran my course, and I had I had done it. I, I had done it enough, you know, and and I even though I enjoyed the work at that at that level, it's a hold. And it was crazy one time. It was after I had I had retired, and I something happened. I couldn't work out that day, and I said, "Man, something." And I said, "Man, that's cool. I don't have a fight next week. I don't have to fight next month. I don't I don't have to work out every day, you know." So that was a that was a cool little adjustment. So just mm. just being able to relax, you know, and just. I don't have to do this, you know what I mean? And it, it was crazy. Just having having that kind of leisure was kind of nice. And so, I, go ahead. And go I ahead. can work out now, but I don't have to. You know, some of my my workouts now are not the intensity of what they were back when I was fighting. Right, right. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. And what were you about to say? Well, if someone's listening and they want to know what's going on with you, I think we've talked, you're not big on social media, but, you know, if somebody wants to, to follow you, are there any ways, are there any websites, you got any books coming out, anything like that? Uh, nothing like that. I I do Facebook. That's the only thing I do is, is Facebook. And uh, maybe I will later on, but as of right now, I'm, I'm good. See, so they can hit me up on Facebook, Dale Sunshine Fry. Okay. And for anyone that might be new or has forgotten, of course, we link all this stuff over on the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can check that out there. All right. Hey, well, man. It's been a pleasure talking to you, brother. Absolutely. And before you go, one one more thing I want to pin you down for, if, if I right. may. Any parting words of wisdom for the people listening? Parting words of wisdom is, is kind of like I tell the kids, whenever whenever it doesn't go your way, don't give up, don't go crazy and start drinking, doing drugs. Just just stay the course. Cause time will, it, it, sometimes it takes a little time. You may not get it the first time. Do like me, get it a second time. And then hang on to it for six years. But uh, it is what it is. That's my favorite quote. It is what it is. If that helps anybody, I hope so. But just stay the course. It, it's, it's not life tough sometimes. And Trust me, when you get beat, you know, getting beat in, in our sport and getting beat in a game of basketball or getting beat in golf, it's a whole different gig. And uh, 
You got to keep your chin up and keep cruising because it'll come around. It's clear, at least to me, from listening to Mr. Fry, that he's a pretty driven man. He shared some great advice with us. And how about that acting resume? I'm going to have to go back and watch some of those movies again just to see him in them. And thank you, Mr. Fry, for your time and sharing everything with us today. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find the show notes, including photos with Mr. Fry and some people you are sure to recognize. There's a link to his acting resume, as well as a place to sign up for the newsletter and our other great episodes, of course. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram, and our username is Whistlekick. If you want to know what's going on behind the scenes of the show, check out our not-quite-secret Facebook group. Just search Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. We're always open to new guests for the show, so if you want to throw your hat in the ring or perhaps your instructor or someone else, head on over to the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can fill out the form there. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear that. And can you do that on the website too? If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing. You know, we're always asking for reviews because they help us spread the word of the show and they push us up in the rankings and then new people get to find us so we can keep that whole cycle going. If you like what we're doing, this is the best way to help us out. And remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com, like our comfortable sweatpants. If you're a school owner or team coach, remember wholesale.whistlekick.com. That's it for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.